Every one of us loved that flag. The flag of the United States had been our flag. And yet we felt it must go, and our flag rise in its place. On January 9th, 1861, a band of Louisianians armed themselves and boarded the steamboat National in New Orleans, then headed north to Baton Rouge. Without firing a shot, they seized the U.S. Army's arsenal there and claimed it for the state of Louisiana. They were acting under the orders of the governor, Thomas Overton Moore. The safety of the state of Louisiana demands that I take possession of all government property within her limits. With a large force at my disposal, this demand will be enforced. From public edifices, hotels, and private buildings, the Pelican flag was hoisted and displayed its ample folds to the breeze. The church bells proclaimed the news of secession in vibrating tones, whilst the deep voice of the cannon announced it even more loudly. Louisiana soon discovered that cannons sound different when fired not in celebration, but at her countrymen. On April 12, 1861, Confederate artillery opened fire on the Union's Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Southern forces were led by General Gustav Beauregard, previously an officer in the United States Army from St. Bernard Parish. Shortly afterwards, Beauregard would lead the Confederate forces to victory in the first major battle of the Civil War at Manassas. Louisiana claimed the Confederacy's first war hero. When the Civil War started, some Louisianians could still remember a time when their home first became a part of the United States. But now they were breaking away from the American nation. No one could have foreseen the degree of devastation that the war would bring. When it was over, Louisiana was reconstructed as a part of the United States once again. But the violence, corruption, and social upheaval of that period left scars on the state, some of which remain with us even today. At the start of the war, some 24,000 Louisianians volunteered to fight for the South, more than any other state except Virginia. We are sending the very princes of our land, men of family, men whose loss will be deplored by the whole community. Louisiana's armies were a reflection of her people, colorful and diverse. Unlike other parts of the South, immigrants made up at least 10% of the state's inhabitants. So along with native-born Louisianians, companies were composed of men from around the world, Irish, Italian, even Slavic soldiers. Perhaps most surprising to some, were the many free blacks who volunteered to defend Confederate Louisiana. By 1862, more than 3,000 free men of color had joined the Louisiana militia, known as the Native Guard. The Creoles, like everybody else in the South, wound up on the Confederate side of the war. From the start, this American Civil War seemed very far away from Cane River. In a handful of cities, Memphis, Mobile, and New Orleans, a relatively small number of free blacks were organized into local militias. These home guards were not officially part of the Confederate Army, but served to protect the city in which they lived. Of those, only the Louisiana Native Guard in New Orleans was of substantial size. Louisiana had a large population of free blacks. Black soldiers had served in the French and Indian War and other past colonial conflicts. They served as soldiers, scouts, sailors, and workers. They served next to white soldiers. In New Orleans, over a thousand black soldiers and officers formed the Native Guard in 1861. But of the thousands of young men who eagerly stepped forward to fight, few were prepared for the horrors that this war would inflict upon them and their homeland. 
they had no idea what it would actually be like when war came along, what it would take to sustain the armies in the field, what it would entail as far as losing fathers, sons, and brothers in combat. They just had no clue what a long war was going to be like. Throughout Louisiana, people of every class and color pitched in to help needy soldiers and their families. Before long, however, many at home could no longer help themselves. McDowell and Burnside finally achieved a united federal assault. Confederates retreat in disorder from Matthews Hill. McDowell thinks he has won the entire battle. When shattered Confederates retreat across Judith Henry's land, John Henry is forced to evacuate his mother. Not expecting a battle on this ground, we had not moved her. We took her upon a mattress and carried her out, intending to take her to Mr. Compton's. John and Ellen Henry never reach a neighbor's house with their mother. And before we reached the woods, she begged so hard to be taken back that we returned to the house. By now, Confederate sharpshooters have hidden themselves in and around the house. The 27th Virginia arrives with other reinforcements. They join Confederates from Matthews Hill in a line held atop Henry Hill by Jackson, just 300 yards from Federals gathering slowly by the Henry House. Reinforcements rushed by Confederate Commander General P.G.T. Beauregard swell rebel ranks to about 4,000. I'd scarcely got into battery before I saw I was going into great peril. I understood later that there was an old woman inside, Mrs. Henry, who was killed. 